Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome. For those of you who haven't been to Eastern Connecticut State University before, welcome to Eastern Connecticut State University, and welcome to the release reading for the sixth issue of Here, um, which is an annual poetry magazine that I edit uh, with Eastern students. Um, and I want to begin, that, that, that teamwork is, is essential, and I blur through it and we can be quickly, but it's really, this is to provide an opportunity for our creative writing students or other students interested in publishing and literature to get hands-on experience working with contemporary writers and also, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, also learning things like uh, desktop publishing and copy editing and, and, and proofreading and things like that. So students, if you're here, uh, this issue couldn't have happened without you. I would like you to just uh, stand and be acknowledged for a second. Um, and uh, Laura Bidwell is in art class, so she's not here, but Laura. Uh, Lilia Berto was our uh, student editor. Thank you very much. If you can just remain standing for a second, we'll, we'll clap for you at the end. Ava Burns. Thank you, Ava, for being here. Uh, James Donahue, James able to be here? Okay, well James is here in spirit. Uh, Samantha Pine can't be here, she was a terrific screener of the poems. Chloe Ann Ryan is here. Uh, Paige Stegina, uh, also Jordan Baker, is Jordan here? Again, in spirit she is. And uh, these are alums who've stayed on the magazine, so uh, they, there was a 50-50 chance they could make it or not. And uh, Brianna Cormier, and also Rebecca Simkowitz, who is home uh, with a young child, so she is excused. All right, so um, here's mission is pretty simple. Uh, we want to present poems, oh, I'm sorry. Could we please clap? Thank you, Ava and Lilia and Clelly Ann. So uh, here's mission is pretty simple. We uh, open our submissions and, and look around wherever we can to find poems that present stories that bear witness to what it means to be alive at this present moment, which means something different for all of us. Listening to the poems that have risen from the troubles and joys within each other's hearts can make us all better, fuller, and more empathetic people and can help us see each other in ways that we otherwise never would. Uh, each issue of here emerges in response to what we've published before and presents a challenge for future issues. Last year's issue focused on poems that examined issues of racial equity and social and economic and environmental justice. Uh, this latest issue continues that work and seeks to expand the conversation and bear witness in ways that we haven't seen before to what it means to be alive at this present moment. Uh, we have a full lineup tonight, so I'm gonna step aside now and turn it over to the aforementioned and under-applauded Lelia and Clelianne to take it from here. Thank you. everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for the release and reading of Issue 6 of Eastern Connecticut State University's Poetry Journal Here. My name is Lilia Berto, my pronouns are she, her, and I recently graduated from Eastern this past December with a bachelor's in English and minor in leadership communication. Good evening, my name is Clelly Ann Ryan, my pronouns are also she, her, and I am also a recent grad with a bachelor's in English and a minor in communications. Chloe and I have had the honor of collaborating with Dr. Daniel Donaghy and a team of student and associate editors on this poetry journal. While reviewing the submissions, we kept in mind the mission of here, to present diverse, wide-ranging, powerful poetry that relates to being here and what being here means to us as unique individuals, as well as us as a collective being. It was such a special experience to be able to read through the initial poetry submissions for this journal. Each piece of writing was personal, personal meaningful, and full of depth, and allowed us to have some insight on the authors and their individual experiences. Assisting with the development of here has been an honor, as these types of journals enhance our ability to understand and appreciate those around us, and improve our ability to self-reflect and process our own life experiences. Working together on this project has truly been an inspiring experience. As student editors and as poets ourselves, we've come to learn that to read poetry, to write it, is to share. As writers, you share the deepest parts of yourself, your hidden thoughts and feelings, those moments that if you didn't get up them out of your head and onto the page would drive you crazy. As readers or as listeners, we share in their experiences. We share in their joy and in their grief. We share their stories and hopefully through them have been given the courage to tell some of our own. Reading the work of these poets has been a reminder that we must continue to hold space for each other and to remain present in the world around us. Each and every poem in this issue that you hear tonight is being shared in that spirit. We hope that as you hear the poems that are being read tonight, 
you keep the idea of what it means to be here in your mind. As you listen, we hope that you find comfort or inspiration in what you hear, that the words grant you answers or spark questions. The pieces being read tonight are emotional, raw, and personal, and we look forward to hearing the authors of the poetry breathe life into their work. We hope that you choose to celebrate and congratulate Dr. Donaghy, the student and associate editors, and of course, the contributing poets after the reading at a reception in the lobby. Their copies of this issue of here will be sold for $5. Thank you again to the poets for sharing your voices and stories, and thank you all for being here with us tonight. We are grateful to have 20 contributors with us tonight, either in person, virtually, or in a pre-recorded video. We ask that the contributors with more than one poem in the issue present for us the one poem that they most want to share with us tonight. We'll begin with three high school students whose poems won the top prizes in Eastern's 2023 Literary Festival for High School Students Creative Writing Contest, which is judged by poet and painter Aaron Caicedo Camor. The first poet is Elizabeth Johnson. Elizabeth Johnson was awarded the first prize in Eastern's 2023 Literary Festival for High School Students Creative Writing Contest. She's a senior at Rockville High School in her fourth year of creative writing classes. She was recently named a humanities scholar. She hopes to continue with her writing and inspire others to write with their true voice, not with what others expect of you. Um, hi. <laughs> People are like cars in my rear view window. The old blue pickup truck riding my ass all the way to the light, blocking out the need to watch out for the other cars. Cars respect a truck with a place to be until I turn left and they turn right. Like the kid constantly there, nagging, teasing, talking, so much talking, making everyone laugh, always being there, right behind me when needed or not, until we need to separate. Our paths dissect from one another, and I may never see that old truck again. And after being stuck in front of them for so long, it feels weird not to have a big blue truck behind me. Feels empty, maybe even lonely. The sterling white Subaru driving behind me, then next to me, then crossing in front of me, causing me to hit the brakes quick, and as she drives further away, I notice the busted taillight and the duct tape holding the bumper together. Like the girl who I made my world standing behind her and her every bad decision she made until I couldn't and spun out of control. And after pulling it back together and gaining control of the vehicle, I noticed how damage, damaging and painful it was to drive based on others' recklessness and how happy I am to be alone on this new narrow winding road. The tiny jet black Mazda who works to keep a fair distance between cars, no stickers or colors seen, not that it doesn't exist, but not visible to those who outside of the car, as to not show any weakness to those who may judge or ridicule. Like the boy I barely knew, yet I could spew tidbits of information about who he was deep down, the real stuff. The pieces of a human I was barely allowed to know. Consider myself lucky. Most people don't even see them driving by. The lime green four-door forged truck with a muffler as loud as thunder and big bold tires with colorful rims and bumper stickers showing all the places it's been. Cape Cod, Florida, New Hampshire, New Jersey. The goal? Funky looking. Doesn't blend in with the cars on the freeway. Can be seen from far away. Can't miss it. Won't forget it. Like the girl who's been here for all of it. Adventurous, funny, loud, kind, sweet, with a laugh as loud as the exhaust pipe and eyes as bright as the paint on the truck's doors. You would think they might be mean, a Regina George, the truck intimidating, and yet the lime green front bumper gives you space to move lanes and you can see the driver with a welcoming smile who let you into her inner circle as soon as she saw you. Makes you feel like you might be one of her favorite people. How lucky. The steel gray Jeep Wrangler, Top down, doors off, letting the wind blow through the car and the colorful tassel dangling off the mirror and the bumper stickers showing each of the coastal town from Maine to Florida. On the back tire, an image of surfboards, definition of a beach bum. Like the girl I've grown to love, who sings Rihanna down the hallways and dances like no one else notices, lives in the water, the ocean, the pool, the lake, can always make you smile, laugh, when math class just seems too overwhelming, with a wicked gleam in her eye, always cracking a joke. In a constant state of motion, with the wind blown through her hair, lives in sunshine, goes through life like one of its rays. 
These cars have come and gone. I have changed along the way, trusted, protected, defended. Although I may never see these cars and they may never see me, at one point in time, they were there behind me in my rear view mirror. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next student is Million Stoney. Are they here today? Oh, perfect. All right, I will give your bio then as you make your way down. Um, she was awarded second prize in this contest. She's a sophomore at ACT Magnet High School. Two of her other pieces, The Office and Crystalline Divine Child, were published in the ACT Writing Department's 2023 Quill and Ink Literary Magazine. She hopes to inspire you and provoke deep thinking with every piece of art she creates. I hear her song like a call, an entrancing melody smoother than rippling water, clear against this flashing tide echoing throughout the harbor. Swirling sea foam surrounds her shape while her words beckon me through the mist. The crashing waves come to a calm. Her song paints a picture of beauty as her slender frame enters into view, daintily perched upon her jagged rock. The haze has vanished and warm rays reflect off the vast crystal ocean. Her pale, milky skin soaks in the sun, glowing with radiance and youth. Honey-colored hair flows like silk over her delicate, freckled form. I'm confined within her gaze, drawn closer to my muse with every soothing note she sings. The water, the water steadily rises above my shivering bod, yet I pay it no mind, inching closer towards the ethereal figure, so close yet so far from her grace. I will soon join her in song, singing a new tune of my own, a desperate lament as she ceases to croon, her slender hands dragging me under. Thank you, Million. Our next poet is Kimberly Yankson, who was awarded third prize in the contest. She is a senior at Rockville High School. Through three years of creative writing, she has learned to adapt a personal voice that helps connect others through stories. Taking inspiration from the world around her, she hopes to create memorable, meaningful pieces that resonate with her community. Is Kimberly here tonight? Kimberly? Sorry, I had um, a little bit of difficulty finding where to go, but um, I'm glad I'm here now. <laughs> so I wrote a piece titled, When My Black Hair Wasn't Black Hair. It's about me and my journey with my hair and how I've never really gotten to um, go through the natural hair journey because I've always relaxed it ever since I was a kid. So, <laughs> When my black hair wasn't black hair. One, when I was a child, I didn't understand that I was different from anyone else I would meet. I could count the amount of people that looked like me on my fingers in school. I could probably name them all too. When you're younger, you don't see the differences until an adult teaches you these things. That's why for the longest time, I didn't know what my natural hair was like. From the age of four, I was forced to put a chemical in my hair that stripped me from my coils. I would tell people my hair was naturally straight because no one told me the product I would let my mom apply to my hair was burning the curl out of my hair. It sure did feel like it though. 
I would always complain about wanting to wash it out earlier than I was supposed to. My mom said it, w it was because I was tender-headed, but I think she wanted me to assimilate and become a product of my environment. For a while, I did. I hated getting braids done in my hair. My classmates hated them, aside for the other ones that were black, too. They said it looked weird, but my teacher loved it, even called it exotic. So the younger me couldn't really complain at her backwards compliment. Two, when I was four years old, I started the process of chemically straightening my hair. The feeling of doing so would constantly burn my scalp and burn away the memory that I even had 4C coils naturally growing out of my head in the first place. Because of this, I would tell people at my predominantly white school that my hair was naturally straight. I was unknowingly assimilating to fit in with them until I found out and still would continue to do so. Three, in my head, my hair had always been straight. I had never felt the need to question it, but that part of my culture, my non-straight hair, had been burned away from my psyche. Four, the memories of my hair burn. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Julia Morris Paul, who's the author of two full length collections, Shook and Table with Burning Candle, which is coming in 2024, and the chapbook uh, Staring Down the Tracks. Her poem, Dear Coroner, How Could You Know, first published in here, a pub appears in the 2023 Pushcart Prize, Best of the Small Press Anthology. She serves as president of the Riverwood Poetry Series, a long running reading series in Hartford, Connecticut, is an elder lawyer attorney in Manchester, Connecticut. Thank you. So just as a brief introduction, um, my oldest son, Brendan, died from an opioid overdose in 2020. Uh, so that's where these poems come from. And I'd like to dedicate the reading to his memory. I was asked to read the poem uh, that appears in the best of these small press Pushcart Prize anthology that was nominated by, by the journal here. So I'll start with that poem. It's called, Dear Coroner, How Could You Know? Dear Coroner, how could you know that he was articulate and very, very funny? That he once knew all the state capitals in alphabetical order, won a prize for metalsmithing in high school, loved reggae, Volkswagens, quesadillas with gorgonzola, snowboarding, reading Cormac McCarthy, that he loved how light fell through stained glass windows, his brothers, swing sets covered in snow, insects caught in amber, blank canvases, the geometry of a pieced together bowl, how sun sparked like matchsticks, orange like matchsticks on concrete, that he loved to dawdle like he had time in his pocket and believed in ghosts, in not killing spiders, and forgave, forgave the haters, the suits, and shoppers who brushed past him, muttering under their breath, but loud enough for him to hear. F off, junkie. So the poem that appears in this edition of Here is called Praise Poem. Praise for the journal, its opening entry that says, I am friends with wet boots and dirty socks. Praise for the artifact of his handwriting, the beauty of his graffiti scrawl on its cover. Praise for the journal for giving voice after the silence. Praise for this journal that tells me he believed in angels, that he saw one, wings spread wide at the end of a long, dark street. Praise for angels and praise for solace and praise 
for the woman with sad eyes who gave him three dollars. Praise for his dreams and the stars that lit them like tiny votives. For the dream about his friend dragging a couch across broken asphalt onto the double yellow lines where he sat waiting for his mother to come through the smog of exhaust. Praise for his friend who shared the couch in the woods. Praise for woods and bridges and all night laundromats where clean socks are left in a basket by the door. Praise for clean socks and unlocked doors. Praise for this journal that unlocks secrets, for sloppy handwriting and sloppy truths. Praise for details and literary tricks, for saying I won't go into details and then going into details about licking blood from his arm and doing push-ups on bathroom floors just to get the vein. Praise for the courage to write. Praise for the pen and the spiral notebook, for its 74 blank pages, each one an agony of silence. Praise for all that is unsaid, how it echoes. Praise the unsteady hand, the clenched fist. Praise the pale blue lines that stretch across these pages like a tightrope. Thank you. All right, the next poet's through a video. Um, Kate O'Kane contributed three poems to this year's issue. She is a poet and musician from Philadelphia. She's the author of the poetry collections Homecoming and A Brief History of Burning. We'll now share a video of her reading the poem, Something for the Pain. curled up on plastic chairs, freezing and crying, with my hood up in the ER's waiting area. I barely saw the guy slump down next to me. I didn't see him tie off underneath his eagle's hoodie. I didn't see the spike go in. I did see his narrow shoulders shake. I did hear him sigh, but I just thought, he must have been feeling sick the same as me, COVID positive, breathless, nerves on fire, heart rate 160, fever chilled, heat on the fritz, making it impossible to sweat the virus out. Exhausted after shuffling through gray snow and stamp bags, after stepping over body after body on the Ave toward Episcopal for help, I hardly noticed his head lower as if in deep contemplation or in desperate prayer. I thought, I swear, that he was weeping too, counting like me the newly dead he knew, afraid to name ourselves among them. Then I saw his blue mask drop to the floor, saw his blue lips mouth a final ragged before he fell over and out right next to me. I willed my legs to stand, my feet to move, and I staggered to the nurse's station, coughing, a guy collapsed, please, we need help. Sets of scrubs came running with naloxone and oxygen. They wheeled the guy away behind the closed off corridor. And I saw my own self slumped over how many times begging my breath to come, my heart to beat, my eyes to open, begging the world to give me one more chance and I would stop for good, swearing this time I meant it. A nurse brought me back to a bed, swabbed my nostrils, took my vitals, hooked me up to oxygen and instructed me to rate my pain. I tried 
through sobs and wheezes to describe EBT, lie heap, snap, Medicaid, clocking in for a double the day I first fell ill, sweeping and mopping condos, panting with every step, coming home to one space heater. It all poured out of me like blood, a gush of garbled syllables to the weary eyes and covered faces of those who'd heard it all before and worse. The doctor came in saying they'd monitor my vitals, give me, I <coughs> give me IV fluids and something for the pain. I closed my eyes, waiting for hydromorphone's sweet burn to run through me like a bolt of lightning or a lover's fingers. By the way, the doctor said, your boyfriend made it. He'll be okay. I told him I didn't know the guy who OD'd. I'd never met him. He'd just been sitting next to me. The doctor explained he'd never checked in or gave his name, had no ID, no insurance. He'd just come in crying from the cold to shoot his last shot someplace warm. We see it all the time, he said. I coughed again and my nurse returned, carrying a syringe. Our next reader tonight is Lilia Berto. Lilia Berto recently graduated summa cum laude from Eastern Connecticut State University with her BA in English and a minor in leadership communication. Berto will continue her studies by pursuing a master's degree in higher education and student affairs in the 2024-2025 academic year. With the help of an Eastern Emerging Scholars grant, she recently published her first collection of poetry, Yin Ri Bei. So the recent um, project I went and did with Dr. Donaghy was publishing um, a, a small poetry chapbook faced, focusing on my Chinese adoptee identity. And so one of the poems I'm reading tonight is from that collection. It's called Conversations Over Ice Cream. If I was told that today I'd meet the mother who birthed and abandoned me, the father who tucked me in the blanket and set my newborn body on the ground without looking back, I'd wear my bronze dress from Express. I throw on my tan wedges, sling an expensive looking purse over my shoulder, thus make up over my eyelids and cheeks, and extend my Mandarin Duolingo streak before running out the door. I sit tall on the ride over, peer out the window, say, horses, to myself when I pass pastures. I'd stop for a frozen hazelnut coffee from Duncan and sing along to Lizzie McAlpine blasting in my car. Once I get to our meeting point, an ice cream shop, since they have a feeling that I'm an ice cream lover, I walk inside the building with fields and cows painted all over the walls, sticky wooden tables and sprinkles smushed into the plank board floors. And I'd see a woman smiling with plump rosebud lips and ridges on her teeth, and a man standing behind her with a head full of hair and a freckle or two planted on his cheek. A small cup of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream with hot fudge and whipped cream, please. No, no cherry, but thank you, I'd order. You don't like cherries either? Like mother, like daughter, the woman would say to me with a wink. After the man wipes off loose sprinkles from the tabletop, we'd sit down and I'd tell them that I like to write poetry, play tennis with my sister, bake cookies from scratch, that I used to play softball but stopped when the coaches told me I had to be mean to my opponents, that I grew up in community theater and singing in my high school's best choirs, how I graduated early from community college and was a valedictorian, that I had the opportunity to live in Florence, Italy for six weeks, that my favorite meal of the day is breakfast and that I love when the sky turns pink, when flowers grow on trees, and when I play with my dog, and that the family that adopted me has given me the world. They'd smile at all of this, tell me about themselves. Then they'd open their arms for an embrace, and though I'm not much of a hugger, I'd let them hold me for as long as they wanted, before asking them why they let me go. Thank you. Our next reader tonight is Jose B. Gonzalez. 
Jose B. Gonzalez is the author of two poetry collections, When Love Was Reels, a Connecticut Book Award finalist, and Toys Made of Rock, an International Latino Book Award finalist. He was born in San Salvador, El Salvador, and immigrated to New London, Connecticut at the age of eight, knowing no English. He is now a professor of English at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Thank you. Oh, man, I love coming here because of the energy, the words, the poetry, the students. Unbelievable. Um, sometimes we're told that we shouldn't write about certain topics, and so this poem is about not writing about a certain topic. I had an editor who once told me this. A skillet poem. He shoved my pages away and told me not to submit another grandmother poem or another mother poem. No more poems about the women who sculpted my poems. They who turn sweat into milk will no longer have open doors to my poems. So instead, I wrote a skillet poem that wasn't a mother poem or a grandmother poem. No, that was a skillet poem and not an about my grandmother or not an about my mother or grandmother poem. This was not a poem about my grandmother teaching my mother to patty cake tortillas, how to shape the masa and mold pupusas type, type of poem. No, this poem was about a skillet burning on its sides, a stubborn skillet, a flaming skillet, a charring skillet, a skillet that could make magic out of plantains. No, this was a skillet poem, a poem about a skillet with the iron weight of a bronze statue. A skillet so heavy it needed two arms to be lifted from flames. A skillet so heavy that the day my mother found my grandmother lying on the couch burying her bruises inside her hands. A skillet so heavy that my mother lifted it like a weight over her head. A skillet so heavy that my mother grunted as she ran to the bedroom. A skillet so heavy that she dropped it only to lift it on her stepfather's face until her arms burned, until the insides of his eyes looked burned. A skillet that yelled, don't ever put your hands on that woman. A skillet so heavy, so, so heavy that yes, it deserves its own poem. Thank you. Our next poet is Maria Mar Maziati Gillen, who will be joining us via Zoom today. Maria is the author of 24 books. Her latest poetry collection is When the Stars Were Still Visible, published in 2021. She received the American Book Award for the collection All That Lies Between Us. She is a founder and executive director of the Poetry Center at Passaic County Community College in Patterson, New Jersey and editor of the Patterson Literary Review. She's a professor emerita of English and creative writing at Binghamton University, SUNY. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. I, remember, I imagine I could see my parents dancing. In my imagination, my parents are dancing in the kitchen on 17th Street the table in front of the coal stove, the space around it, just enough for them to twirl a little. My father, happy as he always was to be moving, happy to be having a good time. My mother was more homebound, but in this moment, she's wearing her best dress. It is made of lace and twirls when she twirls. In that tenement kitchen, my father is still light on his feet before the surgery on his back that left him with a limp and dancing was something he could no longer do. But then they were still young. My mother newly arrived from Italy, only one baby so far. She was not a fan of wasting time, though in this image, she seemed happy to be dancing with him, this man who came to Italy to get her, this man she'd only known three months before she met him, married him, and if her love had, life had been different, if they had had more money, if she had had time for leisure, perhaps they could have danced like this. Maybe they did one night after baby Laura was asleep. Maybe they did dance with two music from Italy on the old radio. Maybe they did. I hope so. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Maria. Our next poet is also zooming in. It's Aaliyah Cotton. They are a queer poet of color from Reston, Virginia. She earned her MFA from Boston University, where she was a recipient of the Robert Pinsky Global Fellowship. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Poetry, Prairie Schooner, Ru uh, Rust and Moth, and Southern Humanities Review, and she has been nominated for the 2024 Best of the Net Anthology. Aaliyah lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, where she creates music under the moniker October Love. Hello. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. This poem is called Self-Portrait. This body charged with skin of high noon, of sweet roasted sands blown into sea dunes, with ears waiting cool and rippling harmonics, and almond-shaped eyes with pupils of onyx. This voice all brined in ocean's soft timbre, of mellow marimba under sun-glow amber, with leather smooth palms cut glossy from diamond, and deft fingers chiseled by sharp-winded islands. This head so dressed in rainbow-kissed curls of billowing waves and honey-silk pearls. This body with lips of sap, of falling moon, of budding bloom, of dawn come soon. This sand-dollar heart washed up on the shore, a cadenza that swells and ebbs at my core. Our next poet is Natalie Schreifer. Schreifer is a bi demi writer often grappling with sexuality, identity, and shame. She loves asking people about their fictional crushes. Her most recent are Riza, Hawkeye, and Gamora. A Best of the Net nominee, nominee, her work has appeared online with CNN, Wired, Insider, and NBC, among others. Find her on X at Schreifern1 or on her website at www.natalieschreifer.com. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me. So my poem is titled, Almost Hiking, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. They burn down sections yearly, another almost hiker tells me in the parking lot. It's destruction in the name of preservation. This park is one of 20 inland pine barrens. Without the burns, it would thicken to forest. The thing that makes it special would disappear. I'm familiar with change and its violence. Every day is a pick your own adventure and smoky New Carner Road is a sign. The trailhead too, blocked by A-frame barriers. Sometimes you have to burn who you are to return to who you want to be. Thank you. Next up is Benjamin Golubov. He's the author of Ho Chi Minh, A Speculative Life in Verse, and Biking Englewood, an essay on the white gaze. Golubov teaches at Lake Forest College. Some of his work can be read on Lake Forest website if you search faculty um, on that website. Hi, th thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be in issue six. Um, this is a poem called A Square in the 48th Ward, um, and it's kind of a gimmick poet because it is square-shaped, it's center-justified, square-shaped, a square in the 48th Ward. This is a square on the Chicago grid defined by Thorndale to the north, Bryn Mawr south, Clark to the west, and Broadway east. It's where Uptown meets Edgewater and the grid goes wonky and bendy. Ashland becomes a four lane here, branching off from Clark, a steep diagonal running northwest southeast parallel, parallel to Ridge, a shallow diagonal that branches off at the feeder for Du Sable southbound. Ridge begins where Peterson, coming in from the west, becomes Elmdale, and Ridge ends in a three way with Bryn Mawr and Broadway at the Flatiron building that houses one of the schools of rock across Broadway from Takaria Uptown. The two diagonals, Clark and Ridge, one steep, one shallow, 
put the grid out of step with itself and make this a neighborhood of oddball streets. Shadow diagonals, one ways and interruptees, dog legs and fifties, sometimes called sixteenthers. Wayne, early, Victoria, the short-lived Edgewater Ave. There's good Mexican and Ethiopian here, some cool little theaters, but what you mainly come for are the streets. Our next poet is Richard Jordan. Jordan's poems appear widely in distinguished journals. His debut chapbook, The Squana Cook at Dawn, won first place in the 2023 Poetry Chapbook Contest and will appear in early 2024. He lives in the Boston area. Hi. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I have a confession. This is actually, I think, the first time I've read my poems to an audience. So hopefully it goes okay. <laughs> so this one is called October One Last Blackbird <clears throat> We went to the marsh to remind ourselves of spring and there it was a single red-winged blackbird flitting in and out of cattails You called to him a brisk check-check oakily as I focused my long lens on the deep scarlet epaulette that flawless golden band I suppose we didn't know we'd kiss right there, but then the clouds had thinned, the hills came into view, and before the bird flew off, well, what else could we do? All right, next up is Steve Myers. He has published a full-length collection, Memories Dog, and two chapbooks, Open, a Journal of Arts and Literature, published his six poem suite, Once There Was a Way, in its 2023 pamphlet series. A Pushcart Prize winner, he heats the poetry track for the MF, uh, MFA in Creative Writing at DeSales University. Great, and very nice to be here. Uh, thank you, staff. Uh, thank you so much for putting this evening together, staff of here. Thanks for all the great uh, poems from the young poets out there in the audience. Um, those with the journal are doing really noble work allowing us to air our own uh, efforts. Uh, it's work that Maria Gillen's been doing year after year after year after year. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. I'm grateful for the wonderful leadership uh, you have uh, in Dan Donaghy. He uh, dresses up pretty good for a kid from Kensington. <laughs> I, I have to say that he had an important shaping influence on this poem, as did John Bargowski, whom you're, you'll hear in a few minutes. It's a kind of be here now poem, uh, to quote from the old philosopher Ram Das. It's called That Day. What mattered that day had already happened, west of Snowshoe by Black Mashanan, where sumac, hickory, Red and white pine close in on Route 80, the Pennsylvania wilds. An overnight ice storm had coated the boughs and sheathed the leafless branches. Even with the heater cranked, even with the sound damping frozen fog, you could hear the crack and snap as some gave with the weight. Then... A lone crow exploding from the roadside in a sunshot scatterburst. Orange, yellow, hot pink light refracting from limbs, still ice encased, igniting the snowpack. The 10,000 shards of glassine crystal fallen and shattered, shooting vectors in myriad directions, slant and skewed, charging the corridor we tunneled through, the air diamonded. And for how long before the gray returned, the color draining from sky, trees, the grimy berm.
Next up, we have Robert Cording, who has published 10 books of poetry, the most recent of which is In the Unwalled City from 2022. His poems have been reprinted in two pushcart anthologies and The Best American Poetry 2018. Is he here? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Sounds good. So the next will be Barbara Crooker, who is the author of 12 chapbooks and 10 full-length books of poetry. Some Glad Morning is her latest, with Slow Wreckage forthcoming from Grayson Books. Thank you, and thank you, Dan and the editors, for having me here. Um, Slow Wreckage actually came out this week. Um, I have two poems that will be in this issue. I'm grateful to only read one of them. These were very hard poems to live through and maybe harder still to write, and they're also gonna be hard to read. So here is, is uh, one of them, and I thank you for listening. The Empty House. It has an epigraph from Jan Richardson. There are days when the only thing more brave than leaving this house is coming back to it. There's your favorite chair, a brown leather recliner, the one you're not sitting in. The large screen TV is silent, it's blank black face. There's no one but me in the living room, reading on the sofa, listening to jazz. I look up from the page in case you wander in for a quick hug. You don't. The dining room where the family gathered for holidays is strewn with bills. I need to figure out how to pay. No turkey resting brownly on the platter. No gravy singing in its open mouth boat. Junk mail addressed to you drifts in, even though it's been two years. The kitchen is also empty, the filter waiting for hot water to release the morning smell of coffee. Your granola grows stale in its plastic bin. And the backyard deck, unspeakably lonely. Those soft summer nights we sat in the gathering dusk, waiting for fireflies to rise from the grass. My glass of wine is now empty. The wrought iron chair wishes you were here. Before we move on, was there anybody on Zoom that we might have missed or didn't get a chance to read? So next up, we have Daniel P. Carey, Jr. Daniel P. Carey, Jr. studied English and poetry writing at Eastern Connecticut State University. A past contributor to here, he lives in Manchester CT with his wife, Rebecca, and daughters, El Shanad and Ayn Rosen? Anya Rosen. Thank you. Stanley's Bees. Stanley, in his 70s, limps in and orders a sausage and peppers pie, scratching his face, callous fingertips, scraping stubble like a rake on pavement. Some days he watches me toss dough in the air, splash sauce in mesmeric circles, but today he pulls a jar of honey from his jean jacket, tells me he keeps bees. He was five when his father in Poland kept him home to smoke hives, breed queens. While his friends played soccer, Stanley measured moisture in honey until he left home forever. He hands me the mason jar. I hated my father and his bees. Now they bring him back to me. We want to say a final thank you again to all the poets who joined us here tonight, whether it's via Zoom or in person. And thank you all again for listening tonight. Um, yeah.